We are very honored to have uh, to have Rob Aiken. Rob Aiken is an ARM fellow responsible for technology direction at ARM Research. He works on low power design, library architecture for advanced process nodes, technology road mapping, and next generation memories. He has worked on more than 15 Moore's Law notes and has published over 80 technical papers on a wide range of topics. Dr. Ecken joined ARM as part of its acquisition of Artisan Components in 2004. Prior to Artisan, he worked at Agilent and HP. He holds a PhD from McGill University in Canada. Dr. Ecken is an IEEE Fellow and serves on a number of conference and workshop committees. The title of his presentation today is Distributed Machine Learning for Large Scale IoT Systems. Please welcome Rob Ecken. Thanks very much. Now I'll have to see which of these buttons does something. Let's see. Oh, that one did something. Perfect. Okay, so the, the first thing that we'll notice about machine learning and, and given the crowd here is that we're fairly high on the hype side. So you know that how this works, right? We go from wild enthusiasm and then we hit the trough of disillusionment and then we come back up on the slope of enlightenment. That has been going on a couple of times in AI. So in, uh, in the 80s, I worked on expert systems in, uh, in a lab at the Alberta Research Council. The guy who ran it, his name was uh, Ernie Chang. And he had a, a PhD in computer science and an MD degree. So we were working on medical expert systems. It was, it was kind of cool. The challenge was that the compute capability at that time was just not enough to actually do much that was very interesting. <coughs> But over the intervening 30 years worth of Moore's Law, the compute capability has really improved dramatically, and that allows us to do all kinds of things we couldn't do before. Now we're talking about, instead of you know, billions of things, now we're talking about trillions. So here, here's a particular um, chart. And uh, out of curiosity, how many of you guys were at ARM TechCon this week and saw the talk I gave there? All right, so a few. I will attempt to make it different, so we'll have, you won't get bored, I hope. But this slide is similar to one that was there. It's essentially, if you're going to have trillions, what on earth does that mean? And are there a trillion things at all? That's an interesting question. Well, I, it, as part of looking this up, I looked up how many beverage containers are made every year, so soda cans and beer cans and so on. And there are 400 billion of those things made every year. So here's an entrepreneurial opportunity. If you can figure out what on earth anyone would do with a connected soda can, you have a 400 billion a year opportunity. So be aware of that. Where are the trillions? When you look at the, the world of where stuff is, most of the stuff is going to be right out at the edge. So smart toasters or, or smart sensors, and, and it's not all home automation. So we tend to think that when a lot of the pictures we put smart refrigerators and smart toasters because people can identify with that. But when you think of a factory floor or a semiconductor fab or something like that, there's lots of machines there, lots of equipment generating huge amounts of data. There's a lot of sensors that exist there. That part of the edge is where the, the trillion-ish volume is, and then it works its way back up into the cloud where you're you know, few orders of magnitude below that, but still very large numbers. What do they do? And it, interestingly enough, get, given the connected containers example, there actually are not, not strictly connected, but there are intelligent wine labels right now that you can buy. They're actually, they're made out of plastic, so the electronics on them are actually embedded in plastic. And what these things do is they just keep track of the temperature of your bottle of wine. So, but when you buy it, if you bought a collectible bottle that had this on it, it would be able to tell you whether it had been stored properly its whole existence. And that's actually a useful activity for something. There's, there's also things like connected power drills. And you think, why on earth do I need a connected power drill? 
Well, there are actually two reasons for it. Number one, if you have a connected power drill, it requires your smartphone to be nearby. So if you're working on a construction site someplace and someone walks off with your power drill, it doesn't work anymore because it's not next to your smartphone. But in addition to that, there's things like torque capability that the machine actually has. It has the ability to do very precise torquing, but there's no interface on an existing drill that lets you do that. But when you connect it to a smartphone, now you can have a much more complicated interface that allows for high precision. So again, it, it, the question is not what would you connect, but what wouldn't you? So again, lots of opportunities. Go invent stuff. Make your parents proud and your family rich. <laughs> the, the basic IoT algorithm is simple. There's essentially two components to it. You have a bunch of sensors. Each sensor does something. So whatever it is sensing, it gathers some data. It generally gathers more data than it can send anywhere. And so it has to process, decide what it's going to send, and then it sends it off to the cloud someplace. The cloud has the same problem, but on a larger scale. Lots of stuff comes in. It has to process that, figure out what you do with that. So again, if, it's a, if you're building a smart factory someplace, you might want to have one of the functions say, oh, um, that machine looks like it's about to go down. Maybe it's time to do some maintenance. That's the example of something. You might also have an optional actuator. So if you have a dam, for example, and it's instrumented, you might have a piece that says, oh, it seems like it's a good time to do an overflow now from this dam. So an actuator would open the gates. When you think about the actuators, there's an important security ramification to it. Because, these things, because they're things, and they exist in the world with the rest of us, they can start causing problems, start breaking stuff, start injuring people. So security, safety, resilience are really important as well. OK, so let's look at communication. So when you look historically at, say, the television era, everything is downloaded. You know, you get a program, it goes to your TV, nothing goes back out. In the mobile smartphone web era, there's mostly download, but there's still quite a bit of upload as well. You get the cat video and you say, I like the cat video, show me more cat videos, or no, I don't like cat videos, please show me cute puppy videos, or whatever. So information goes this way or that way. But in, the, in IoT, it's actually inverted. Most of the communication is upwards in IoT, from sensors to the cloud. Huge amounts of data go that way. And that changes the, the way that we have to think about communication. It changes the way we have to build things. And there's sort of a little matrix on relative volumes of data going up and down in the system. The real key here, though, is to reduce communication. And you saw some of this in Dr. Lee's presentation, where there's various applications generating just enormous amounts of data. And you can pull out, I think you can get to petabytes, and you have people who put exabytes on scale, and then you have people who put yottabytes and zottabytes and supercalifragilisticabytes and all these kind of things up there. But the, the essence of it is there's just huge amounts of data there, and you have to do something with it. So this was, a, this was another quote I used in the presentation the other day. This, is, this guy was a, one of these political bosses in the 19th century. And his, his thing was, don't write something down if you can say it. Don't say it if you can nod. Or don't even nod if you can just sort of wink. <laughs> Leave no trail. But. Uh, it, Despite his, uh, his motivations, our motivations are actually produce the same result. We want to reduce communication in these large-scale IoT systems. There's a lot of data being generated. We want to reduce that. So I took a look at my house. This is what IoT looks like in my house. It's actually a subset of IoT. I thought it looked miserable and bad until I was chatting to a friend of mine, and he showed me this apartment that he's building. He's got building a connected apartment in, uh, in Europe. And he has these closets with cables, thousands of cables spilling out because he's got everything in his house wired up to everything else. It's just a nightmare. I have just minor bits of wiring, like that little thing over there in the corner. That's a, a connection from a solar panel to my computer Wi-Fi. And the solar panel's alleged range is 75 feet. But its real range, if you include things like walls, is more like 30 feet. So you have to build this little intermittent station that catches the solar panel signal and rebroadcasts it to the rest of the house. 
I'm a, I'm a fan of wireless things, so I don't like to have as much wire as, uh, as my friend in Europe does, but I've got still a bunch of wires that hang out. So the mess like that is a byproduct of the existing IoT. In the future, we want to get rid of that stuff. All right, so we're allegedly talking about machine learning here. When we think about machine learning, we need to think about what actual kinds of problems are good for machine learning. They tend to have four basic characteristics that you can see here. So it's important, to nit at, for example, that the solution can be graded objectively. So what I mean by that is there's a right answer. So in this case, you know, we have a, what is this a picture of? Well, it's a picture of a bird. That's a right answer for this problem. It's also a picture of a frog. It's not really, well, it could be a picture of a swamp. It could be a picture of food. Again, it's context dependent. But there is a right answer in a given context. It's also important that there be a lot of data available. Because again, as you saw in Dr. Lee's presentation, there's a huge amount of training that's necessary. And the more data you have, the better your training works. It's difficult to describe the solution and program a conventional piece of software will get too complicated too fast. And lastly, doing this by hand would just be too hard. So those are the characteristics of a good machine learning program or problem. Let's look at a specific one. So again, this is a little chunk of IoT at my house. This is the view outside my front door. So I bought one of these little cameras and it shines that, or it takes pictures there. And it tells you whether any motion has happened. And its motion sensor is not very smart. So if leaves move, it says something happened. If shadows move, it says something happened. And you'll notice the, the picture is nothing but leaves and shadows. So it just reports, something happened. Another thing happened. Something else. Hello. And that's not actually what I care about, is it really? No. More, uh, more I care about is my grandson walking out the front door. That would be useful to know. No. Is the UPS person coming? That's also useful to know. Is Godzilla attacking my camera? That's also useful. That actually is a picture of a moth. So a moth at night attacking the infrared sensor on the camera looks like that. <laughs> but again, this is the kind of thing that makes a good machine learning problem. There's a, there's a lot of data here, and there's really hardly any information. So top picture, nothing happening. Bottom picture, grandson walking, UPS guy. I can summarize all of the information on this screen in one tweet. But instead, the camera's producing megabits per second. So using machine learning to reduce that is a good activity. Um, this is an aside, I wasn't sure how much math we'd have here. Um, my, my son is doing a PhD in math, so he says this is not math at all, but it, it, it looks math-ish. <laughs> Neural networks, in a way, are really kind of curve-fitting to very complicated functions. So they apply a curve-fit-like algorithm to a function that's too hard to describe. Uh, there's another piece of thing, this is good advice for if you are or want to be in marketing, Talk to whoever invented the term deep learning. It is the most awesome marketing term in the history of the universe. <laughs> so on the left, we have a deep thinker. On the right, we have deep network. The only thing that makes that network deep is the fact that it has a lot of layers. <laughs> so a deep learning is just learning on a deep network. But because the word deep has this alternate meaning in English, it means that, mm, yes, that's very deep. <laughs> but it's not, it's just a network. Here's what it does, it just takes a, a basic piece of a neural network, takes some inputs that have some weights, and it applies some function which can be sim as simple as a threshold function of just do all the weights here add up to some number, and then carries on. So that, again, the fundamentals of this are not really that complicated, but they're very powerful tools. Just taking this structure allows you to do some very interesting, very complicated things. You can put these things together. Here's a, here's a deep network. This is a, a Google Net. And you can see just you know, how many layers that is. And again, there's a lot of complexity to it. But the, the specific thing to pay attention here is there's sort of 20 plus gigaflops, which means 20 billion operations, floating point operations, to go through one pass on this thing. So that's a lot of computation. And that, partly explains why my 1980s AI career really didn't get anywhere, because you needed 80s style supercomputers that would have taken a long time to get through 20, 20 gigaflop orders. 
Now, Dr. Leo alluded to this as well. How many bits do you need for those weights? How complicated are they? If you give it to a computer scientist as a starting problem, they make it a floating point number, or maybe they make it a double precision number. But it doesn't really need to be. So, so we had some work in our research, and Anjan Lai is sitting over there, did, uh, did part of it. And, it. and it was essentially looking at how many bits you really need to represent these weights. And when you look at it for different networks and different problems, what you see is that there's sort of a minimum threshold below which nothing happens. And then very rapidly, it peaks to a point where you don't get very much better by adding more precision. So this is an interesting thing when we think about how to build neural nets and how to build machine learning at the edge, because you, with this smaller precision numbers, you can use a lot less computation than you needed otherwise. We also can think about how much information is enough. So here we have some pictures. And we say, well, what are we actually trying to do with these pictures? So we might say, well, we're just trying to say, OK, there's a car, there's a toy car, and there's a thing that isn't a car. So that's a pretty simple characterization. But if you use sort of an inception style network, you can get not necessarily this much, but huge amounts of information pop out of it. And not all of that information is necessarily particularly useful. So we don't really care that that's a you know a type, little tyke's cozy coop. We just care that it's a toy car and not a real car. So what do we do with that information? Well, again, the thing is, how simple can this be? Is really the open question. So here's an example of some work that was it was actually done locally. There's a guy named Matt Rubashkin who did this, and what he was interested in was the problem of how do you spot Caltrain. So the schedules that Caltrain posts and the actual reality of Caltrain arriving don't necessarily have a lot to do with each other. <laughs> but by building this simple train spotting network, what he did was he took the TensorFlow and adapted it for, you can actually, you can go to this page yourself, it's called TensorFlow for Poets. So who knew that poets could do TensorFlow, but apparently they can. And you use the Inception V3 and you train the last layer of it, to re and he trained it in this case to recognize the difference between three different kinds of trains, a Cal train, a freight train, and a light rail, trucks, and just nothing. And with that simple training, his network is now able to uh, recognize the train and connect it up to a video camera. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, so what do we do with that? Well, I thought, I wonder if I can do this with my problem. So I tried. So what I did was I retrained, I took the same process that, that Matt used and I retrained on my images. So I had a bunch of images of bushes and a bunch of images of people, trained up the network, and it was able reasonably well to distinguish between bushes and people, but it was still making mistakes. So the two pictures here are things that it wasn't quite sure what they were. So I was able to tell it, okay, the first picture, that's not people, and the bottom picture, that is people. It's actually, apparently my daughter runs pretty fast. <laughs> made it blurry. But in any case, it's now much better than it was before. So with two sets of training, I was able to get it so it discriminates about 99% of the time. And again, this is some sort of machine learning um, exercise that you can run on an edge-style device like a Raspberry Pi. So again, you don't necessarily need super hardware to do this stuff. So can you run, basically, can you run inference at the edge? Well, the previous example was using TensorFlow on a Raspberry Pi. Yep, you can. What does that look like? It's still 20 gigaflops-ish of operation. It's actually, Inception V3 is less. But because of a Raspberry Pi is a reasonably powerful computer, it's able to do that on a sort of a reasonable frame rate. So 3-ish, 4-ish frames per second is not a problem for it. What if we had a microcontroller and an accelerator of some kind? So using an FPGA, for example, or using a custom-built one on, a, on an ASIC. Again, that, there's lots of results on that. There, there are plenty of people who have published that. That's, it's doable. The next level, can I run it on a microcontroller all by itself? The results here are promising as well. So again, there, there's, uh, talk to the engine if you want to know some more. There's, there's stuff that's happening that allows you to do the inference part of machine learning on very, very simple computers. Um, this, is, uh, I, this is the back, somebody took the back off of their IP camera, and, and if you look at it, there's, there's kind of an ASIC in the middle that has an ARM CPU on it, and again, you could, th these things are simple enough, you can run stuff on them. 
not necessarily this one, because I think it's an ARM7 TDMI, so it's, it's probably a little bit too simple. What about training? Well, training's harder. Don't do, tra don't do training at the edge is, I guess, the message that I would have. You can, do you can run training on the cloud. It takes 44 minutes, I guess, so that, that, that's not bad. There's a, there's a couple of interesting things that come out of training, in addition to, to what we've already heard about today and what we'll probably hear some more. The, the example here of this uh, the set of glasses from Carnegie Mellon, that's an example of what it, what's called adversarial machine learning. So they used machine learning to, to beat image recognition machine learning. So they tried different styles of glasses in different colors in order to come up with the glasses that were best at throwing off facial recognition. So if you wear those glasses, then the facial recognition tools have no idea who you are. <laughs> but of course, that's today or last week. Now, the people who make facial recognition will go, oh yeah, we better include those kind of glasses too. So next week, you'll need a different kind. And so on. There's this sort of arms race that begins and that come is sort of the intersection of machine learning for security and machine learning for breaking security. Okay, so where did we get to with all this stuff? Uh, essentially what I wanted to leave you with is that inference on, and machine learning is certainly something that can be done at the edge. It's all fundamentally about reducing data volume and improving the, the latency of the IoT control loop. There's some security ramifications, resilience ramifications, and so on that you also need to work, be aware of. But again, can you do machine learning on a distributed large-scale IoT system? Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Atten. Um, I, I like uh, when you were talking about uh, the question is now what type of devices would you connect? Is what type of devices wouldn't you connect? So as we open up to the floor, uh, don't just think about what kind of questions would you ask? But consider what kind of questions wouldn't you ask, Dr. Akin? So with that, we open up to one question. Oh, yeah, then uh, the main uh, black shirt. Uh, yeah, my, my name is yeah. Mike. I joined CASPA in uh, August 2009. Thanks, Mr. Lake. Uh, so anyways, I've worked in accounting for many years, and, and I read all the time from the Cal CPA emails I get daily about artificial intelligence. And so if you could mention how, how that would affect the accounting profession, which has been around for hundreds of years or even a couple <laughs> thousand years. <laughs> it's a very old profession, and it's been very stabilized. I think obviously a lot of the routine tasks would be uh, eliminate, but even some of the, the like forecasting and all that, could you comment on that? Because that's pretty practical, I think. So is, the, is your question, what's the role for machine learning and accounting, or is it, will a robot steal my job, or is it some... Combination. Okay, so so I think in, in most fields, well, let me, my accounting skills are rudimentary, my wife doesn't let me touch the checkbook. <laughs> Um, and there's probably machine learning opportunities in tax evasion, but in more <laughs> normal activities, what, what we found in, in electronic design, for example, is that there's a, there's a lot of automation that exists already, and there's a lot of algorithms that are already pretty optimized. And ML, machine learning can make them slightly better, but it doesn't necessarily make them dramatically better. And I think we'll hear some of that from David White later as well. But the places where machine learning is good is taking a look at problems where experts are able to identify a solution quickly and where non-experts struggle. So by doing some training on watching the experts, watching the, the AI systems are, or machine learning systems are good at pattern recognition. What are the patterns that underlie the things that the experts view this way or that way? That's the kind of place where, where I would say machine learning can help. There's a related one in sort of actuarial studies when you look at extreme values and, and you know, ta tales of improbability distribution. So how likely is it you know, for a fire to come along or how likely is it you know, that you have three, five hundred year floods in a year, that kind of thing. So th there's 
ways of improving that capability by understanding the math better that machine learning can also play in. So yeah, that's lots of potentially in anything, I think there's applications for this stuff. All right, when, we just, well, just quickly, we talked about Halloween parties before. And again, I mentioned I'm not trusted with the checkbook. I'm also rarely trusted with the calendar. And apparently there's a Halloween party at my house that I'm meant to be hosting with about you know, 20 people coming. So I apologize that, that I won't be able to stick around very long. But Leonjen is over there, and he knows way more about this stuff than I do anyway. So talk to him. <laughs> OK, before we go to the Halloween party, may we have uh, uh, Brenda? to uh, present a token of appreciation to Dr. Ecken. So we have set up a meeting.